the super slam. There you go. We're recording this. So <laughs> Uh, just so everyone knows. Um, I wanted all of our slammers to know that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm Sue Slagenhoff. For those of you I don't know, I'm the scientific director of the Research Institute and my office works on um, several different things. And one of the main things that we do is work to communicate about the remarkable science that goes on at the Mass General Research Institute. And we, um, we do some other things as well, but today is all about communication. So it's so important. I think you can just look at what's happened over the last year to realize how important it is that we all learn how to communicate about the science that we've done and, the sci and communicate to the public. It's not always easy to talk about science and to, to talk about your work in layman's terms, but we all need to learn to do it. Uh, science is at a critical point in our country. And many of your neighbors, they might not even know you're a scientist because we don't generally walk around telling other people in the grocery store or the neighbors. And then I hear people say, you know what, I don't actually know a scientist, but I'll bet you living in Boston, they do know scientists. They just don't know that we're scientists. So we need to tell people we're scientists, but also be able to tell them about what we do. So um, it's all of our responsibility. So go out there tomorrow, but take one thing away, tell someone who, who you know, who might not know you're a scientist, that you're a scientist. So a few years ago, we received a visionary gift in the Research Institute to support our communicating science initiatives. And these science slams grew out of that. Um, so we did several of these. We typically are not looking at each other on Zoom like this, we're at a bar. So that this is a little different. And so we wondered how it would go. So we've done, we've done these as part of the Cambridge Science Festival. We've done them at a couple uh, bar in Cambridge. And then the last several we had at Boston Beer Works over by North Station. And uh, they've all been a lot of fun. Uh, it's interesting to have people get together and try to, in three minutes to tell you a little bit about their science. Um, but we were really excited to go virtual. We didn't know how it would work, but we did the um, the grand slam with our baseball theme. That was around that was a that time of the playoffs. I don't think we were quite at the World Series yet, but around the time of the baseball playoffs. And so we thought the next one should, of course, be the Super Slam in honor of this week's big game. So um, nothing feels like it used to, obviously, um, but I think we. You know, as I said, we were really surprised about how much fun we all had taking an hour out of our day and listening to people talk about their science. So we, the Research Institute, we love to partner. And as you can see on these hats, this today we're partnered with the Broad Institute, who's been great to work with um, on pulling this together. And so before we get started, I just wanted to ask Brad, as a representative of of MGH or slash Brodies, to say a few words. Brad, sure. Thanks, Sue. Uh, yeah. Brad Bernstein, joint faculty at MGH Pathology and the Research Institute and at the Broad where I'm directing the Gene Regulation Observatory. Uh, the Broad MGH uh, relationships obviously incredibly important and has been uh, immensely fruitful in terms of the advances and discoveries that have been made over the years. And for this group, there's a lot of ways to engage. Um, and if you want, uh, just feel free to reach out to, to myself or to Patrick Eleanor if you need advice on how to how to plug into the, uh, the MGH Broad uh, opportunities. Um, so I'm delighted that we're co-sponsoring this event. Obviously super important, 2020 has taught us, taught us that scientific communication is uh, so important to uh, communicate to our friends and our communities and our political uh, leaders uh, so they make good decisions. Um, excited to hear from you all. Great, thanks Brad, yeah, thanks. Yes, yeah, certainly, definitely, we've learned a lot in 2020, and um, it's it, it just couldn't be more important, right? That we that we figure out how to talk to everybody about science. So, um, a little housekeeping. I mentioned we're recording. I mentioned that uh, I think it's good for the slammers uh, to keep it in gallery mode. I hope many of you have these signs that we sent, although they're hard to see with these virtual backgrounds. But basically, touchdown versus. I'm having a horrible time with mine. Somebody show. I got to move away. Maybe like this here. Touchdown versus timeout. Um, so as you're slamming, if you have, if you, if we can't understand what you're saying, is anyone able to see them? You can also, just in case you don't have a sign or if your sign isn't working well with your virtual backgrounds, you can always use your reactions. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, 
a, a clap or a check mark or a thumbs yeah. up on Zoom. Exactly. Just let, let people know they're doing a good job and that you've understood what they're saying. The timeout is really, we don't want the slammer to stop. It's just really designed, like if someone goes like this or does the timeout, it's really designed to tell someone, we have no idea what you're saying. So think about what you're, you know, try to tell us in lay terms what you're saying. Um, you'll have three minutes. Gloria is the timer. Gloria, wave and yell and give us an example of the timer. Hi everyone, I'm Gloria. If you look at my screen, if I'm on your front screen, I'll have a virtual background that has a three minute timer. And once you're ready to start, you'll see my screen go black and you'll see the three minutes in the upper corner. Perfect. So Gloria will be the timer. Okay, um, anything else I forgot guys? I think we're good, right? I think we're ready to get started. Okay. Well, you can do the touchdown symbol and the timeout. Right. Yes. With your hands, so, if you don't have anything, that might be easier for people to see. Exactly. Yeah. And then I, this sign is an awesome idea, except it's completely invisible on my. Let's respect. Maybe we should have tested it out, but. Maybe, but you know, we're not pros here, Brian. <laughs> and yeah, last time we did post-it notes, and post-it notes are a lot smaller. Yeah. So maybe we can hold them right in front of our face. Right. Exactly. All right. Well. we'll and then go. the other. Touchdown. The other thing is timeout. At three minutes, we'll play you off with the uh, NFL theme music. Okay. All right. Um, so before we get started, we couldn't get Carrie Underwood, but we have Cora. Kick us off, Cora. Are you ready for some science? Woo! We're ready, Cora. Okay. So um, that's Brian's daughter, just so you know. She's ready for some science. So we're gonna get started with Jacob. Jacob, where are you? Point, wave your hand. Okay, Jacob, right there. So everybody, can everybody see Jacob? Jacob works at MGH in the Cancer Center and uh, Rad Onk. So Jacob, take it away. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jake and I work in the Miyamoto lab as a research technician where we look for biomarkers that predict treatment response in uh, bladder and prostate cancer. Today I want to specifically discuss this project that I'm working on where we're trying to find uh, biomarkers that predict the treatment response of radium-223 in patients with uh, metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. And so I know those are a lot of uh, fancy words, so let me explain those. Uh, first and foremost, uh, many early stage prostate cancers uh, t tend to depend on normal levels of testosterone in order to grow but in castration resistant prostate cancer, actually, even when the testosterone levels are reduced, the prostate cancer still develops anyways. And so uh, in the metastatic version, the most common site of metastasis is to the bone. And so in order to uh, co combat that, uh, we're investigating this radio pharmaceutical called radium-223. And my first prop is also, it's a periodic table. I don't know if you can see. Uh oh, you muted, Jacob. Hello? You hit mute, good. Sorry, it's this, uh, I have this periodic table prop that isn't really showing up, but uh, if you look at your handy dandy periodic tables that I'm sure you all have, calcium and radium tend to, are in the same column, so they share a lot of chemical properties. And along those lines, in a nutshell, radium-223 similarly targets the bone, which is the uh, key area of metastases for this uh, prostate cancer. And so it's difficult to acquire biopsies to study this, uh, these metastases because they're deep within the bone. So both logistically for surgeons, but also because of the immense pain, that's not really an easy option. So our lab uh, focuses on circulating tumor cells, also known as CTCs, which are these rare cancer cells that are, have broken off from the primary tumor site and are circulating within the blood. They sort of serve as this potential liquid biopsy. So a simple blood draw could allow us to isolate out these cells and investigate uh, them for biomarkers. And so the way we do that is that we use this microfluidic chip, which hopefully if I angle it right, yep, microfluidic chip that does this awesome job of removing the red blood cells, removing the white blood cells and all these other components, hypothetically leaving us with unaltered circulating tumor cells. And so I'm fortunate to be working at the intersection of being able to operate these awesome microfluidic devices that isolate these circulating tumor cells and also doing the downstream computational analysis where I statistically analyze the data. And so I'm really fortunate to be working on this translational project where uh, these results that come straight from the hospital 
I'm able to, or we're able to study them and then hopefully use them to guide treatment options for our patients. And I really wanna highlight how grateful I am that these patients who might be going uh, quite immense pain undergoing these treatments are so kind enough to donate their blood to help us do this research. And so on that note, thank you everyone. And I don't know if, I don't think there's questions, but thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Ryan, play the music just because. That was perfect timing. Yes. That? Um, that. Okay. The sound guy. Come on. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So I don't know if anyone put questions in the chat. I don't know. We didn't talk really that much about the questions. Anyone have something burning they need to ask? So, I said so. Great job. Okay. Thank you. Excellent job. Okay, let me close this. Okay. So one other thing I would say is that hopefully you can see everybody's names and everybody knows who the slammers are. So if you have questions, this is also a good way to meet new people. Uh, connect with them after the slam and ask them your questions too. That would be great. Um, so thanks, Jacob. Our next slammer is Leslie, Leslie Greiner. Um, she is from the Broad Institute. She's a senior group leader in the Center for Development of Therapeutics. Where's Leslie? Right here. Okay. Perfect. I have a co-pilot today too, um, awesome. Jen Roth, who's the assistant director, associate director. Okay. He's somewhere. I can't see her, but she's going to help me. Um, yeah, I'm up here. So. Oh, here she Hi. Is. Okay, good. Hi, Jen. So, all right, you ready? We're ready. Okay. Ready, Gloria? Go. Okay. So barcodes. They're pretty much everywhere you look when shopping in a grocery or a department store. They allow us to more intimately participate in our shopping experience, whether it's self checkouts or the way we get packages delivered. But now more than ever, bar barcodes in the medical field are critical to ensure patient identification and tracking. And how about right now with COVID especially? So, well, that's the reason that we wanna to talk to you today about how we use barcodes in molecular biology. So what are some of the barcodes that we're used to seeing? Jen's gonna show us some of the traditional barcodes. We have one from, there we go. That, you know, I'm really BBC. bad at Zoom, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. um, oh, you got barcodes it. on Advil. Advil, magazines. So they're everywhere, your right? Pizzas, mail, all your mail has barcodes on them. Everyone has barcodes. Right, so we also have these other things called QR barcodes. I don't know if people are used to kind of, you probably can't see it on here, but how we now pay by Venmo and things like that. So what we want to talk to you about today is get this. Scientists have found a way to harness the power of barcodes, but not to inventory merchandise or get our Amazon packages, but rather to add individual DNA barcodes. So DNA is the barcode to our cells and catalog them in a unique way but at a molecular level. So our team at the Broad is using unique DNA barcodes. And what we're essentially doing is this is a neuron. It's not a cancer cell, but we use cancer cells. So we take this DNA barcode and we put it into the cell and now it has its unique identifier. What that allows us to do is not only can we use one sample at a time where we used to grow things in Petri dishes one by one by one, but we can grow them in 384 samples at a time. And imagine that when you can multiplex the cell lines too, you can grow upwards of 20 different cell lines in one well of this 384 well plate. So what Jen's gonna do now is give us a little demonstration. Do you wanna do it, Jen? Of how we think about picking out the barcodes that survive versus uh, picking out the barcodes that don't. I will try in very quick time. So yep. as Leslie said, we have some barcodes, you know, just regular different colors of barcodes, and they go in the same ratio into a little dish. They go in, we treat them with some Motrin or something like that. <laughs> and then after that, we put them in the oven for about five days. And when they come out, we have more of some of them. And oh no, the red one's gone. So we don't have a red one anymore. So we know now that the red barcode is not, doesn't like Motrin very well. Awesome Great. job. So the red cell would be dead and that's how we would try to cure cancer. Awesome. Yay. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. I appreciate your participation.
Yes, awesome. Uh, awesome to bring a buddy and props. Very helpful. Thank you, Leslie. That was really great. I think everybody that's very understandable. Very good. Um, our next slammer is um, Seamus Guler. I hope I said your name right, Seamus. Yeah, that was good. Okay, good. Um, he is at MGH in psychiatry. And I didn't find him on my screen, like move around. I'm here. Oh, you I see, see you. Now? Okay, perfect. All right. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. I see you now. Great. Okay. Are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay. Gloria, are you ready? Okay, yep. go ahead, Seamus. Hey, everyone. Uh, I work at psychiatry department at MGH, and our project is on how we feel pain and how we can reduce pain in chronic pain patients. Specifically, we would like to treat patients with chronic low back pain. Now, two interventions that might work and are promising. One is acupuncture, where you insert needles at certain sites on the human body. And the other is brain stimulation, where you zap someone's brain with electricity. So in our lab, we said, why not both? Let's combine acupuncture with uh, brain stimulation. So we will insert needles, apply acupuncture, and at the same time, zap this person with electricity and hope that these two interventions interact in a super nice way so that we can amplify the reduction in their, the patient's pain scores by as much as we can. Now, we have uh, collected data from two people so far, and the first person who got the interventions, she said, I feel good. And I'm like, well, boss, would you like to maybe <laughs> publish the results? And he's like, well, how about we collect it from many more people and see if Matt agrees with us? And so I think what's going to happen is in the next two years, we will keep collecting data from people with chronic low back pain. And at the same time, look at some of the previous data that some other people already collected, one of which is UK Biobank. And uh, so that uh, data analysis is mostly to understand how pain works so that we can uh, optimize the interventions and one particular result we found so far by analyzing someone else's publicly available data is that if you feel pain, you don't have a good sleep. And if you don't have a good sleep, you are more likely to have pain. So they feed it each other. And uh, so, which is, which is an interesting finding. And we are trying to combine now interventions that target pain and sleep since they, uh, kind of affect each other. I think I'm done. That that was it. Thank you. And let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Seamus. Thank you. Connect with Seamus. Right. Certainly everybody knows if you don't get a good sleep, then you're in pain. I agree with you. Um, great. Thanks so much. Um, did we, I'm not hearing the music after the slams. I don't even, oh, Brian, you moved on my screen. What's going on with our music? Well, everybody's finishing on time, so I feel like I know, no, no, I'm not I know, here. I know, I know, but we're missing. The, we're missing the. the yeah, we're missing hearing it. Oh, so somebody asked a question in the chat. Okay, let's um, see. What do you want to read it? Do you want me to read it? Well, she's asking, what is, what is the premise of pain alleviation? Reduction of inflammation, or the outcomes of elect or outcomes of electricity on perception. Hmm or the effect but, of electricity on perception? That is a fantastic question. First of all, let me uh, summarize briefly. Okay, uh, you only have a, like a, a few, sorry. a couple, yeah. like not so, long. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, the analysis we did shows that inflammation, pain, and sleep, they are all related and one may be mediating the relationship between the other two. Uh, so the brain stimulation part, we do expect it to affect the brain circuitry of pain and does not necessarily uh, affect the inflammation. The acupuncture may be uh, affecting the inflammation itself, 
more directly. But this is all, I guess, on my part at this point. Okay, thanks, Seamus. So in a couple of years, you need to come back to a science slam and tell us everything you've learned when you've figured out like how to fix it, okay? Yeah, sounds fantastic. Excellent. Okay, good, good, good. So our next slammer is James Coleman. James, are you James or Jim? Uh, I go by James, my dad is actually Jim. Oh, okay, yeah, I don't wanna call you by your dad's name. So we're going with James, okay, good. So James is at the Broad in the Stanley Center. So James, welcome, thanks for doing this. Thank you for having me. Um, so yeah, as I'll just get started, as Sue mentioned, I work in the Stanley Center at the Broad. Um, and today I'm super excited to get to have the opportunity to show, tell you guys a little bit about the research I've been doing related to schizophrenia and testing potential new therapeutics. So schizophrenia is this complex neurological disorder that is characterized by thoughts or experiences that seem out of touch with reality. And as a prop, I just have this little like brain squeeze, you know, stress ball that I <laughs> tend to, to squeeze quite a bit. Um, and it can be kind of broken down into two simple categories of symptoms. So you have positive symptoms of schizophrenia, which are things that patients may start experiencing like hallucinations or delusions. And these can actually be managed using antipsychotic medications, which have been around for quite a few decades now. One of which is uh, chlorpromazine, which I have a molecular model of right here. Um, so it's basically just this, this small molecule that can be used to treat positive symptoms. However, there are also negative symptoms or things that patients may lose, um, like the ability to think clearly, remember things, um, and critically get good sleep. Um, and these have not really been addressed by pharmacological interventions up to this point, leading to approximately 80% of schizophrenic patients not being able to work. Um, and so as it turns out, there are these waxing and waning oscillations of electrical activity known as sleep spindles that occur when we sleep. And they are correlated with our ability to think and remember things. So we know they're really important. Um, and I actually have a back of the envelope, literally back of the envelope drawing of a sleep spindle, which you can't really see. But that's what a sleep spindle oh, looks like. And so recent studies have shown that sleep spindles um, are kind of driven by the firing of these neurons in a specific brain region called the thalamic reticular nucleus or TRN for short, which on a horizontal brain slice slightly resembles the shape of a banana. So I have a banana here just to show the shape of what that looks like. Um, the neurons in the TRN express a calcium ion channel called CAV 3.3 which um, we also know are critical for the sleep spindle generation. Interestingly, a mutation in the gene which codes for CAV 3.3 um, leads to decrease in sleep spindles and increased risk for schizophrenia. So I'll take the last few seconds I have to kind of show some of what, uh, the techniques I use. Um, right now I'm learning whole cell patch clamp recording, which is essentially you have this neuron, which is this balloon in this example, and you have a micro pipette, which is a recording, you know, micro pipette, it's a straw in this example. And by applying positive pressure to the tip of the uh, micro pipette, you can create a little dimple in the surface of the cell membrane or this balloon. And by quickly releasing that positive pressure, you create negative pressure, which helps it stick. And basically you gain access to the cell by breaking it open. Um, and by doing that, you can then record and you know, do all sorts of electrophysiology experiments um, and test new therapeutics, which one day may lead to a new treatment for schizophrenia. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, James. Ryan is a little, he, you can tell he's a little, you know, he doesn't really want to cut you off with that music. Um, no, no, no. He, he, he had to. It, he had to. He made it just in time. Just in time. Um, yeah, that was great. I love the use of props. You get uh, extra props for the use of props. Um, it's always good to use props. Although, like I said, we, we're going to have to decide next time, team, about virtual backgrounds versus props because. That the last slam we had, we had someone who had multiple people with multiple props and, and that worked really well, but maybe not with the virtual background. So, um, okay, we have one more slammer to go before it's halftime, special treat at halftime. Um, so I'm going to go to uh, Deepika. Did I say your name right? Hi, yeah. Where are you? Yeah. Oh, I'm I here. see you right there. Okay, yeah. did I say your name right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Topeka um, is in the Diabetes Research Center at MGH, and she is a research fellow. Yeah. 
Should I? Should, okay. Uh, so go ahead. Hi, hi everyone. So uh, in my lab, we are working on a project to design some hyper rapid insulin receptor activators <laughs> that will more rapidly uh, absorb and clear than the ultra rapid insulin formulations. I mean, that's scary. Let me explain. Insulin is a hormone. Okay, that I was, is I was to... about to time out for real there. I was like, I don't know what you're saying. Explain. <laughs> uh, insulin is a hormone that is needed to allow sugar to enter cells to produce energy. Type 1 diabetes or the insulin dependent diabetes is a chronic condition in which the pancreas produce little or no insulin, usually because body's own immune system mistakenly destroys the insulin producing cells in the pancreas. As a result, uh, type 1 diabetic patients have high titers of antibodies against the insulin molecules. So the classical way of treating type 1 diabetes is by administering some insulin analogs, which are pretty much similar to the uh, insulin itself. But it is well known that when patients uh, with type 1 diabetes are given the insulin analogs, there is an increase uh, in their anti-insulin antibody titers because they have already broken the tolerance in insulin and are therefore quite uh, likely to generate antibodies against closely related insulin analog molecules. So we are working on the development of small molecules that will act as a hyper rapid insulin receptor activators which will be more rapidly absorbed in the blood and cleared as well. So what would be the benefits of doing so? So the insulin receptor activator peptides we'll be using in the project are much more smaller than the insulin itself and don't have the primary sequence homology with the insulin. So these peptides would not be the target with the anti-insulin antibody. So they are expected to be absorbed readily. So the big idea of our project is to modify the sequence of these peptides in a way that they can be a target for the degradation uh, with the enzymes that are already present in the body, thereby reducing the half-life of the peptide. So that will lead to the reduction in the tail effects of the insulin. And it would reduce uh, it would reduce the chances of the hypoglycemia in the blood. So ideally we want to maximize the action of these insulin receptor, uh, the, these peptides on the insulin receptors in the liver and muscles while minimizing the actions of the, on the insulin receptors in the kidney that uh, may promote the um, hypertension. So you might be thinking that could peptides developed by this project trigger other antibodies uh, not related to insulin in a type 1 diabetes subjects. Well, it is, it is always possible that a non-self-peptide uh, that it will provoke an antibody response. However, the peptides we're going to test are relatively smaller, uh, about 31 to 36 amino acids long, and are designed to be degraded rapidly by uh, into two shorter peptides with the enzymes. So shorter peptides are likely... Uh, less likely to promote an antibody response. So if they, are, they, they, can only, they can only trigger the antibody response if they are, if they are conjugated to a larger protein. So, so, so it's very less likely that there will be an, antibodies against these peptides. So uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a project that's all about, yeah, I'm done. I'm muted. Sorry. Brian, did you see me pointing at you when her time ran out? I was like pointing Dude, at I him. Was on. Is he going to know I'm pointing at him when the time ran out? I know it's hard to look at all the screens at the same time. Um, thank you guys so much. So we it's now halftime in our show. We have a two minute halftime break. Um, I'm, I, I can't wait for y'all to see it, but I think it might make you just a touch nostalgic for the way things used to be. So Brian, Half time, two minutes. And then we have four more slammers.
Or does it make everyone tear up because it's, it's hard to watch it's hard to watch right it's hard to watch that it, it's been too long since we were all in situations like that it makes me sad i didn't realize till earlier today was the first time i saw it and i was like oh my gosh hey brian people were asking science will get us back there together what's up people were asking in the chat if you would cut that together yourself <laughs> you want to think i did you see my <laughs> visual skills do you think i cut that <laughs> Oh, it's on YouTube. I found it there. It's on YouTube. Um, we just used it for the thing, but science is what's going to get us back to being in those crowded stadiums, everyone. So keep doing the, the good work. But it does, it definitely makes me feel like I didn't realize I missed that so much, yeah. you know? And then, uh, so we'll see. I'm sure it'll look a little different this year. Um, all right, back to slamming science. We'll try not to get all the clamped over the halftime show anymore. Uh, so who do I have next? Six. Trevor Atkinson, Atkinson, uh, also in the Stanley Center. Hi, uh, I'm a member of the Stevens Lab. I think it would be better if I turn off my background so you guys can see my props. Perfect. Okay. Um, so Alzheimer's disease is a neurological disease characterized by cognitive loss um, and synapse loss in the brain. Uh, microglia are the resident immune cells of the brain and they may play a key role in AD. Let's say your brain is your sorry. Let's say your brain's microglia are represented by this population, this package of M and M's. Uh, different colored M and M's are populations of microglia fulfilling different roles in the brain. So I don't know if you can see these M and M's. Uh, now. Okay, very nice. Um, so these popul this population of microglia may be emitting cytokines. Let's say the orange ones are clearing debris. Um, but by sequencing uh, the RNA um, of microglia in uh, diseased brains and healthy brains, uh, researchers identified a unique population of microglia, let's say the red microglia, um, that are unique to uh, Alzheimer's disease. And these red microglia um, are known as disease-associated microglia or DAMs. Um, now DAMs are characterized by the upregulation of genes associated with Alzheimer's disease and the repression of genes associated with homeostasis. Um, in cases of Alzheimer's disease, uh, these red dams, uh, they become activated and they form cell clusters. Um, the transition of homeostatic microglia uh, to the disease associated microglia uh, suggests, uh, sorry, during Alzheimer's disease, suggests that these dams play a really key role in Alzheimer's disease. However, we're not really clear about um, the mechanism of activation from homeostatic microglia to dam microglia. Um, additionally, there isn't really a good model to study dams at this point. Um, so to explore the dam state in Alzheimer's, uh, we used a type of stem cells uh, called induced microglia-like cells or IMGLs. 
uh, we expose these IMGLs to factors associated with AD, uh, let's say beta amyloid, like this, um, or, um, uh, sorry, or dying neurons. And we found that when we expose the IMGLs, these factors, uh, there's an increased population of dams and a lot of the homeostatic microglia were activated in the dams. Um, we then validated these findings by exposing uh, different populations of, of microglia derived from stem cells uh, to these same factors and saw um, the dam state activation across different stem cell lines. Uh, these findings suggest that IMGLs or microglia derived from stem cells are a good model to study the dam state um, and their role in AD pathology. I'm sorry if that was confusing. Perfect timing. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm going to put you on the spot, Trevor, with yeah. one thing. Tell me, tell your grandma what homeostatic means. Cause you said it like 300 times. And so, <laughs> it, and it's a big word. Like, so how would you describe homeostatic? Sure. So homeostatic or homeostasis um, is the regular state, regular or healthy state of cell function. Perfect. Uh, Perfect example of the words we use. Like we all know what homeostatic means, what homeostasis means, but it's a word we all use and we throw around and other people are listening to us talk and they just quit listening because they're like, what, what is that homeo what? I don't know what they're saying, right? So regular state of cells or something like that. So thank you for allowing me to put you on the spot with that one. But it's just, you kept saying it. So I was like, this is a perfect example of how we use these words all the time. And we don't think that other people might not know exactly what we're saying. So sure. thanks, Trevor, that was awesome. Thanks I need to know if you're gonna eat the microglia. Of course. Okay, of course, good, good, good. Okay, great. Okay, so our next slammer is an MGHer, Shannon Stott. Shannon works in the Cancer Center in the Department of Medicine. And welcome, Shannon. Hi, it's great to be here. So I'm also a little nostalgic today. I'm thinking back, back to when I used to be able to travel to conferences and I was at a conference dinner and I remember another attendee was challenging me and he felt there was no value to diversity in science. And he had asked me at the dinner, he's like, Shannon, are you really going to tell me that when you look through a microscope, you're going to see something differently than me? And I said, absolutely. I feel like I love microscopy. It's like art and it's all about what you see and your history and what you've lived and how you do that. And we collectively all come together and find out where the value is and which direction to go. And so I'd like to tell you a little bit about my perspective as a food allergy mom. I have three beautiful children who have the worst GI symptoms and I had to test their poop all the time. So when I was at home, and COVID was coming and we were all trying to think about what can we do? We were listening, wondering, is COVID going to be in kids? And I remember the first place they found it for children was in their diapers, it was in stool. Then we all heard about the toilet plumes and all of the difficulties and grossness of bathrooms. And I thought, yes, that is what I wanna test. I wanna test poop. Because what I do in my normal life is use tiny little devices and put things like blood to pull out rare things. And I can use small volumes and do this. And I mentioned this to my family on one of our Zooms and they all went, no. But I mentioned this to my lab and my postdoc, Daniel Raby, who was phenomenal. And he said, yes, I will test poop for you, Shannon. I will test poop and stool and blood. And then I also, there's someone who I work with in cancer, Jean-Vierre Bolan, who is a phenomenal researcher, surgeon scientist in between treating COVID patients. Ali was creating pseudovirus for us so that in a safe way, we could start optimizing our tiny technology to see if we can actually come up with an assay that works. I also have to acknowledge Lizzie Flynn, who's also here on the Zoom. She joined us in the middle of COVID looking at pictures of our lab on Zoom to see if she wanted to work there. When moved so that she could not have to put her other family members at risk of COVID to come in and do this work. I'll also say it was the first time we ever had people in our lab say, yeah, I'm not gonna donate a biospecimen. And so in fact, Daniel, oh, it's not gonna show up, COVID negative stool. We had to go pick these up throughout the various biorepositories that were out there, trying to see what can we do as engineers and biologists to do a little bit of an impact here. 
So I hope that I've convinced you that my perspective as an engineer, a food allergy mom, we were able to come up with something that we hope will eventually either help this particular pandemic or something in the future. Because just three weeks ago, we got the great news that we got a large grant from the NIH for a million dollars a year to bring our test forward. So I hope I can come back. And I also hope that I can convince you all to get over the poop fear. Everybody poops. It's a great accessible way to do testing in a variety of different ways. So thank you for your time. Great, thank you, Shannon. That was awesome. That was totally awesome. I love the get over the poop fear and that people wouldn't give you samples. You know, like it is one of those everybody does it thing. I think you know, as a mom, you certainly um, become quite familiar, and a dad, and a dad. You know, we yes. become quite parents. Familiar. Parents are very familiar with poop. Very familiar. Very very familiar. Um, that was awesome. Thanks, Shannon. Um, okay, our next slammer, Amy. Amy Tam who's a research assistant at the Broad. Where's Amy? Hi. Uh, Over here, Amy, nice to see you, great. Uh, so okay, I'm, you ready? Yes. Okay, Gloria. So I'm a research, research assistant in Debbie Marks' lab, um, and I'm gonna be talking about a project involving developing uh, an improved method for predicting protein-protein interaction interfaces or how proteins fit together. So to start with, a protein is a chain or sequence of amino acids arranged into a functional um, structure. Now, because natural selection filters out sequences that are deleterious, we see only functional sequences in nature. And that means the patterns that we see in natural sequences likely correspond to proteins, uh, the, the proteins function. And we can take advantage of this enrichment of in functional sequences to gain insight into how the sequences translate to function. When we line in uh -oh, we have analogous a proteins slammer. in, uh, go ahead. You're good. You're back now, Amy. Okay. Uh, so when we line up different versions of the same or related proteins. For example, analogous proteins in different species, we can find patterns that we call evolutionary couplings between amino acids at certain positions. And uh, what that means is that when an amino acid at say position I in the sequence mutates in a certain way, the amino acid at position J changes in a corresponding way. The idea is that if the amino acids in a protein interact in a 3D structure, to facilitate the protein's function, then, the amino, then when the amino acids evolve, they will evolve together. And uh, statistical models that take advantage of these evolutionary couplings have had huge success in predicting protein structure as well as the effects of mutations. There has also been significant um, success with using evolutionary couplings to predict protein-protein interaction interfaces, or again, how the proteins fit together. And um, a prominent limitation in predicting protein-protein interactions using evolutionary couplings is how to pair the different versions of the two proteins. Some species have more than uh, one version of protein A or protein B, but not all versions of protein A will interact with all versions of protein B. So uh, our current models pare down a number of possible combinations by taking one pair uh, per species with that one combination chosen as our best guess according to some criteria. But that means potentially losing a lot of information from pairs that the, the models don't consider but do interact. So in our lab, we're trying a new approach by simply taking all possible pairs uh, within each species. The idea is that um, the evolutionary couplings representing true amino acid uh, interactions will stand out because real pairs of interacting um, proteins A and B probably going to impact to provide similar function rather than nature having to evolve a whole interact uh, and fit together to perform a similar function. Thank you, Amy. I think Amy gets the prize for best use of Christmas decorations <laughs> post-holiday season, right? Was that tinsel and Christmas lights? Yes. yes, it was going a little in and out on the virtual background, but excellent job. Thank you, Amy. Uh, I also want to point out that I think another slammer, maybe the last one, is going to talk about a different project in the, a, the same space. Okay. Okay, great. 
Um, so our next slammer, are you referring to Trevor? No, I did Trevor already. Kelly, Thanks. right above you. <laughs> Kelly Brock, excellent. Kelly is a research um, associate research director at the Broad. Kelly, we're so glad you could be here. Hi. All right. So to start, I'm also in Debbie Marx's lab and I'm a teammate of Amy. So I'm going to be talking about something similar, but applied in a little bit of a different way. So what I'm really interested in are basically how human diseases arise. And one of the ways that different diseases can happen is if you say have a mutation in your DNA, your genetic code, that actually translates out into what your protein might look like. So proteins are building blocks in the cell that are basically a chain of what are called amino acids. And a big question is how exactly you can get these amino acids to fold up together to make your protein structure because a protein structure is inherently tied to how it actually functions in the cell. All right, so a quick demonstration. Sometimes you might have a protein and I start from a sequence like this and maybe I might fold up like this into <laughs> a particular structure. Sometimes maybe I spend most of my time sort of like this, other times, Maybe I'm a bit more flexible. Maybe I'm sometimes I'm like this, or sometimes like that, sometimes like that. Now, my question is, how can we actually figure out different ways to tell whether proteins are mostly like this, or if a particular protein might look like this, or this? All right, so I will have my lovely assistant over here to demonstrate a way that we can actually use computers to get this information. This is Toma. Now, everybody imagine that I am just a sequence. So that set of amino acids. Now, let's say my arm is a very particular amino acid. Now, what, and Tomo, so maybe I'm the human version of the sequence. What if Tomo here were the sequence in say, a jellyfish? Now, what we can do is maybe if say I change my amino acid here like that, maybe there's a corresponding change in a completely different part of the sequence in a related sequence. Now, what if we had say, oh, maybe there's a change here and now there's a change there. So what happens when we have thousands and thousands of related sequences like this made generated by labs all over the world we could actually use a mathematical model to be able to look at all pairs of positions at the same time and be able to use that to tell us what the fold looks like. And the really nice thing about this is that by using a little bit more math and a little bit more information about known structures, we can actually tell when proteins are maybe forming completely separate structures to what's already been known to find out more about human disease. Awesome, Kelly. Thank you. Best use of what did someone put in the chat? Um, yoga, science, <laughs> yoga, right? Best yeah. use of calisthenics for for your props. That was awesome. And she's uh, wearing a jersey. Exactly. So. And my T jersey. So <laughs> I'm representing all of the Boston area folks. Okay, good, good, good. We'll take everybody. Anyone who wants to come. We've had, you know, when we would um when we had these science slams at bars, we would put it out on social media and such. We had we would have people showing up from, we had people from MIT. We had, we had once a few medical students that were in town, but they were, where were they from guys? Like Sweden or something. Yeah, something they came, yeah. uh, we, we collected a lot yeah. of people from elsewhere. You know, they'd see it advertised somewhere and then they'd come. So it's great. So that was really great. And that was a great last slam. So Brian, did we have something at the end of our science slam today, our super slam? Uh, no, nothing no. formal, okay, just to thank you to everybody. Okay, so I really want to thank everybody for coming. This is a great turnout. We had, you know, we managed with 70 people throughout. Thank you to the slammers. That was a really, really great time. It's so great to hear about your science, the diversity of the science that you do, the way you explain it. I challenge all of you who are here to think a little bit about how you might, even if you didn't slam today, think a little bit about how you might explain 
your science if you had to. It's not as easy as some of these people today made it look, right? We use big words and we use words that we all understand with each other, but other people don't understand. So I challenge you all to think a little bit about it. I'm hoping maybe in the fall we'll be able to be together again, but watch out. Maybe there'll be an Olympics version of the slam coming this summer, probably still on Zoom. Um, so keep your eyes out for it. Please tell every tell your friends and families and everybody to join and everybody you work with. And uh, thanks for taking this hour and spending a little time with us. And thanks for all the props and the waving neurons and microglia, I guess it's waving at us. So thanks everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Lou. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for coming everyone. See you later. Thank you. Thank you. Super fun. Bye.